Good evening, everyone. We have Skinny E Media on this time, not doing a BBFC VMPAA podcast. I decided to change up a few things and get one very special host who, if you follow this uh, podcast series like you should do with Rob Babbis, you very much have heard of Cutting Edge. And here is the brains behind it, Gavin Salco. Of Hello, Cuts thank you for having me. How do you do? I'm very well, thank you. I'm doing wonderful. I'm just happy to have you on board um, as we discuss about our legacy and history with film censorship as uh, fellow people who are sort of known for this in the YouTube sphere and melon farmers, which you're connected with as well. Yeah. Well, it goes without saying, just for anyone who is out there, cutting edge, arguably one of the most important and vital YouTube channels of GNC Films that discusses about censorship between various regions for select titles that uh, caused a bit of alarm or had to get cut and trimmed depending on the market. Films like Da Vinci Code, Casino Royale, Equalizer, True Lies, and Mrs. Doubtfire have all been victims of these processes. And here we have the mastermind to discuss how this came to be. I think my connection with Melon Farmers goes back to goes back over 20 years. I think it was about uh, 2000. And um, I'd watched Cliffhanger on it and it had been on BBC One. And um, I think I'd gone on to the IMDb to rate it. Um, I think this was the film. And there's a section on there called alternate versions. Uh for any films that are released in either a director's cut or indeed have been edited by a censor board. And I went to the old, the alternate versions for that particular film and was reading all the stuff that apparently was missing from the UK video version. Now, I was quite naive at the time because I assumed that films were only cut when they were on the television. And I thought that they were always on cut on video. I just I never gave it any thought. So I'd read about this, all these bits that were missing, 90 seconds worth of violence or whatever it was. And I think I did a Google search and Melon Farmers came up and it listed on there everything that was cut from the UK versions of Cliffhanger. And my heart sank. I was like, oh, great. I've, I've, I've just watched a censored version and I can't buy an uncensored version. And of course, Melon Farmers has an A to Z on there of everything that's been cut or altered or changed. And um, I think I spent that entire weekend going through the A to Z and l- my mind was blown that all these films in England and the UK had been had been cut. And that really annoyed me because I don't think art should be censored. Um, and that basically opened the doors for me to get a multi-region DVD player eventually. And any time a film was cut in the UK, even slightly, I would spend the extra money to import the American version or the Australian version, they were usually less expensive. Um, so that's how I really got into film, to being aware of film censorship, particularly in the UK. Um, of course, the UK is not the only nation in the world that edits film. So I then looked into the MPAA, or the MPA as it's now called. Um, and it kind of just snowballed from there. So it's something I've been interested in for over 20 years, and I find it absolutely fascinating. So from our earliest experiences, it's fair to say that uh, film censorship and ratings have certainly piqued our curiosity in the most strangest way possible. Despite our age difference, our experiences are somewhat similar in some respects. Uh, actually, I got my start from film ratings and censorship out of curiosity because of Toy Story, of all Toy things, Story. which uh, PG rated, a millennial favourite. Yes. But uh, it's a bit of an unusual PG because a lot of Disney films at that time were all used certificates, but it got a PG because of imitable behavior and techniques as the villain Sid plays with matches and rockets, that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah, that's not something that obviously I was I saw that film before I was aware about edits and stuff made to films. And I, I never thought much about the why it was rated as it was. But obviously, I since learned that um, the the reasons for that. I think, if, I could be mistaken, I'm, I don't know everything, but I'm pretty sure that film is a G in the United States, but I can't be 100% sure about that. This is correct. Yes, I thought it was. It happens quite a bit. Um, 
than you imagine where there's rain discrepancies depending on the territory. A more extreme right. example would be I Capture the Castle. PG in the UK, rated R in the US. Oh. I am I'm not I'm not familiar with that film at all. Uh, could you give me some information on that? I don't I haven't heard of it, I don't think. It's a like costume drama in the vein of like Jane Austen or okay. um, Emily Charlotte Bronte. Okay. But um it's the sort of movie my grandmother would enjoy, but it mainly got it on the basis of a very marginal issue like nudity. Uh, and then okay. on the flip side you've got Badlands, which was past X by BBFC and got an 18 for so long, but it was past PG in the States. Yeah, that is that is really crazy. There was a period obviously where they didn't have where we didn't have the PG thirteen here in the States. And therefore, from what I understand, the old PG, it was originally it was originally GP actually. Um the original PG was quite um was quite a, a wide reaching rating um i believe all the president's men is another example it's a 15 here for the strong language and in america i believe it's still a pg even though it's got multiple uses of the f word in it um they actually was originally rated r but they got a pg on an appeals process oh really i did not know that Uh, that's that's amazing that would never pass as a pg now obviously oh not one bit i mean Capitalism, a love story, and uh, Philomena had problems trying to secure its ratings, but capitalism was rejected, still remained an R. Philomena got a PG 13, but that had two F words, um, right. which they're a bit more flexible with nowadays, but um, usually the rule of thumb is one, no more, no less. It cannot be used with sexual connotation, and you cannot say mother with that particular word. Bizarre. Yeah. It's um it's a it's a bit of a it's a bit of a falsity that's um to say that they only allowed one F word in a PG thirteen. There's multiples multiple films that have allowed more than one use off the top of my head. Um the born identity has a, a spoken use as well as a muttered or mouth use. And that's a PG thirteen. Um behind enemy lines has got I th- I've only seen it once or twice. I think there's at least two, possibly three uses in that movie. Um, Social was, Network was one as well. Yeah, and there were also, quite remarkably, I've never seen it, but there was a film, you might know this, there was a Will Smith science fiction film that was released in the last few years. Do you remember what it was called? The Gemini Man. I think that's it, yes. That film has got a use of motherfucker in it. And that was given a PG-13, and it also received a 12A, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, that's almost never done. <laughs> yeah, the, I, never I looked done. it up on the BBFC website, and they explained, I think it's in their long-range um, content description or whatever they're calling it these days. It'll always be consumer advice. That's the I always remember that, and I still call it consumer advice. I believe they outlined in there, or perhaps in their annual report of the year that that movie came out as to why they allowed it. Um, but because I haven't seen the film, I'm not, I can't really speak about the context or whether I thought it was right or wrong because I haven't seen it. My usual co-host um, can sort of answer on that respect because I think he saw it himself. Uh, for me, I'm generally a little bit more picky about what I see more than anything. But to me yeah. too. <laughs> Through personal experience between us, um, as far as cutting edge titles that you ranked and reviewed yourself, I do like the Equalizer films. There was a third one that came out recently that was past 15 uncut, but that film, weirdly enough, was just as violent as the last two. You know, no, we're going to say some spoilers here just for anyone who's listening, but uh, you've seen Equalizer 3, right? We're actually planning on going to see it before it uh, before it leaves the cinemas. I, I haven't yet, but my wife and I are planning on going to see it. Obviously, she's seen the other, she's seen one and two, and we're very excited for the third one. Even from the um, there was what's there's a thing in the states here called a red band trailer, which is basically an R-rated trailer for an R-rated movie, and we watched the the red band 
trailer when that was released online and it looks particularly vicious and i said to her i bet you any money that it's a 15 with edits at the cinema and they'll release the 18 version on home video and of course it came out as being rated 15 uncut and i'm very surprised but i would like to hear with you having seen it what you thought about it especially as it compares to the first two and don't worry about spoilers i don't mind okay then well here it is the skinny e media review I, I don't think it's as good as um the first one but i will mm-hmm. say this as far as violence is concerned it's certainly brutal i mean we see decapitations uh the implication of sort of mafia gangland violence where someone's far more hand is cut off and quite graphic shootings and the scene where a man gets a a gun jammed up to his eye and he sort of shoots from the eye socket which that and the decapitation scene and also dismemberment of someone's arm as some form of interrogation for what you're trying to mess with um the intraghetto or cosa nostra mafia syndicate but that's the sort of violence i would prefer you just keep at the 18 level um i mean 15 year olds 16 year olds know a lot more these days than even when we were children and certainly oh, when absolutely. you were children well i i prefer you know there'd be a little bit of discretion and nostalgia on our end where you know there's what i would call rite of passage my co-host usually thinks i have lost my mind whenever i talk about this but there are certain films or certain particular types of genres where once you turn 18 anything goes and i feel that way about vigilante movies and crime and sort of graphic serial killer torture movies and porn so the yeah, equalizer I... sort of is a throwback to those sort of 18 shoot 'em up revenge movies yeah um it's i i more or less agree completely with everything that you that you've said and obviously i'm against censorship and I think that they've, the fact that they've passed the film uncut, um, Equalizer 3 uncut, is a is a good thing. For the last few years, and I thought I was the only one who thought this, there does there has seemed to, be, to have been, I would argue there absolutely has been, a particular uh, weakening or more permissive attitude at the 15 level than there was even 15 years ago. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah, and I don't know... How I feel on one hand, I think, as you said quite rightly, so that yes, um, anyone who's 15 and 16 now is more aware of the world, exposed to more social media, wasn't around when I was 16. Things like that obviously do have an effect, and the BBFC have to keep up with the times. But I do think every now and then I see something that's a 15, and I go, God, that's that for me would have been an 18, you know, back in the day, as it as it were. Um, and then there's other times like the Equalizer films where I'd feel, and I discussed this in the episode that we did, that they didn't, if you're going to cut the film, at least have the cuts make a difference. There's there's very little difference in overall tone and strength overall of the violence in Equalizer 1 and 2. In the cut versions, there's, there's very little difference between that and the uncut versions. So if you're going to cut the film, and I think I argued this in the episode we did on Equalizer 2, um, if you're going to cut them, at least have the cuts make a heavy difference instead of just a few minor snips here and there that do nothing to dilute the overall ferocity of the violence, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely there. I mean, a lot of people have said the same thing about films like Red Sparrow or uh, John Wick Chapter 2, which they had to cut out because of suicide, and then uh, Red Sparrow because it's shown garroting or someone being you know, uh, strangled by a wire and it's bloody yes i heard uh, that yeah yeah uh, you know the, here's the weird thing about all this you know i know people like to blame america for being this puritanical paradise but at least in the u.s that there is some sort of leeway you can get through that sort of stuff past at r or if it's like nc-17 level you can pass it with unrated uh, underneath the channels yes absolutely. uk uh, you know there's many moments where i feel like they, they don't quite use that to their advantage and also to some extent like we said with audience demographics because you said this on da vinci code as to why we, it would be a 12a of all things 
I feel you. That is a movie particularly, and I feel that with Equalizer, where the audience who's going to see it is not 15 or 14, 13-year-olds. It's most likely, especially in the Equalizer's case, it's most likely to be people over 45, because, you know, Denzel Washington's um, at least over 60. Yeah, and he he's got that well, I would agree with that too. But yeah, you know, it's a different demographic we're talking about. It's not like John Wick, which has a lot of youth appeal, Gen Z, millennials, equalizers, probably like boomers, maybe Gen X. Uh, maybe. I, I mean, I think, I think action films, which is obviously that we've we've done a lot of those on my show. Um, action films have got a particularly uh, large age gap. And I think when it comes down to um, what they rated in the UK, um, as, as especially with regards to 12A action films, it's all about the money, isn't it? They want to get the most, the widest audience in uh, to watch these. But um, oh, easily, I'm, you know. But that's what the superhero movies are sort of for, not necessarily yeah. <laughs> a, a yeah. movie that your dad would watch. Right. <laughs> well, I know I you're. Did, I. I would agree with you that something like the Da Vinci Code, to me, even now, a number of years after it was released, it doesn't seem to me to have much appeal to anyone who's about 12 or 13. No, I mean, I saw it at 13, and that movie gave me a fucking nightmare. <laughs> you, now, it's very you, dark. Oh, it, no, easily. Dark. Yeah. It's you know quite a heavy film to swallow, dealing with religious and sort of weird political conspiracy theories of sorts. The sort mm-hmm. of thing that make for a sort of side piece to Alex Jones's Neighborhood, which is a, <laughs> a little short that you've done some music for. I but did I, do the score for that, yes. <laughs> but I'll rewind it a little bit back for everyone. Um, da Vinci Code, and to some extent Casino Royale and Elf and Lead, are sort of punchlines on my channel as being these films that particularly scarred me because in Da Vinci Code's case, the naked whipping. Yeah. I didn't know how to respond to a scene like that. And that scene gave me nightmares. And I, I saw that older than 12 and it should have been a 15, should have been R rated. That's just me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would... I would say that I've seen that film a few times, but I tend to watch the extended version because I like the fact that they've it expands the story and it obviously adds back in the stuff that was cut for the MPAA. But um, in the 12A version, I don't think it's particularly graphic, the self-flagellation. However, this, could, this is something I was going to mention about The Equalizer 3, is that often you'll see the BBFC argue and say, well, the violence is strong, but you don't really see much. And I sometimes think, and I would argue, that what we don't see can be more effective than what we do see. And I don't think always that the justification that something is brief or implied doesn't always make it less strong. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, there's many films I saw growing up, and I'm sure you have, where even if it's not shown or explicit, it is still disturbing and horrifying to watch uh, funny games. Uh, often gets talked about in this circle. That's not an explicit film. It's 18, mm-hmm. but all the scenes of violence are shown off screen. Yeah. And it's kind of proof us to some weird, darkly satirical point about media violence and how it desensitizes us. So I know, so, certainly know where you're coming from with that. And yeah. I heard some people even say that about uh, Reservoir Dogs. We don't see the ear cutting. Many people no. were going to puke moment Ooh. well it's it's odd you mention that because my wife and i were discussing about recording another cutting edge podcast because we we've done a couple um and she loves that film as do i and just within the last couple of weeks she actually said she made i can't remember exactly what she said but she said something like well look at that horrible scene where we see his ear cut off and i said your memory's playing tricks on you there the camera actually pans away at the point the act occurs but in her head because we see the aftermath she was under the impression that we saw that happen and this is what i mean by what you don't see can often be worse than what you do i would certainly agree with that assessment 
with uh, the examples that we just gave, um, it, it makes it feel like you're almost there seeing the torture unfold, but then you sort of have to look away. Um, yeah. Tarantino has done that on a, quite a few occasions there. Um, well, the one I can think of was the, in Pulp Fish. You got the um, really nasty um, rape scene. Yes. Much of it's sort of, most of it, about 85% is played sort of in the background. We hear the horrible music and just the, yeah, go on, do it. Yeah. The yeah. deliverance, sort of bad vibes about it. Um, there's certain stuff in the world that throws people off the sort of wrong sort of way. There's people who don't even like... Uh, watching animals being beaten or killed. You can even show that in films as low as you. Like, you know, someone shoots a deer for meat. Bambi scarred millions of children. I'm sure you did too. Yeah, Yeah, I haven't seen it. It's been many, many years. In fact, the last time I remember watching it was, I want to say I was at school and I must have been, I must have been an age of single digits. I can't remember really, but I do remember watching it at school in a group. Well, for me, I, I can't quite speak on Bambi except for that one scene. But uh, the film that often gets talked about as far as scarring for most children is Hunchback of Notre Dame. I've never seen that. I'm, I don't know anything about it. I remember seeing that in the cinema and having the VHS tape. And many people will, will tell you, particularly 90s, late 80s millennials, that that movie was too heavy or upsetting for them. Really? And I understand because it's about religious hypocrisy, violence, Mm -hmm. racism against Romani people, Mm -hmm. Uh, the influence of the church to terrorize the population, poor people, and mocking people with physical deformities. Mm -hmm. And let me remind you, this is a Disney movie. It came out (laughs) a little after Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast, but before Hercules and Tarzan. So, yes. you films back then used to be quite strong and i always tell this to my gen z uh friends and fans that we had it kind of tough yeah yes absolutely i would agree with that as well yeah you know pg can be said about that as well i was just about to say yes i think the kind of the kind of films that i grew up watching that were pg even some of the james bond films for example were um you could argue that some of those today, if they were resubmitted, probably wouldn't get a tw- uh, wouldn't get a PG. I know they raised um, Diamonds Are Forever up to a twelve a number of years ago, which I think I don't fully agree with that decision, if I'm being honest. But certainly, I am. I recently watched Thunderball, and that's a twelve in Ireland, or at least I believe it still is a twelve in Ireland, and that has a particularly bloody final act. I mean, we're talking uh, there's actual bloodletting and. Men being men being stabbed with um, spears in the eye and stuff like that. And yes, it's all rapidly edited and it's got John Barry's wonderful score underneath it. But the end of that film is particularly strong, and I don't know if it would necessarily be allowed at PG today because they've kind of tightened up what's allowed at the lower ages as the years have gone on gone on at the BBFC. Well, absolutely. I mean, around the mid 2000s i would say probably not 03 because they were still in the transition period trying to figure out what to do with 12a but as yeah. the years went on pg has become a lot more softer um, yep. than what i remembered i mean with a few exceptions the simpsons movie paranorman isle of dogs hidden figures um monster house those are quite strong pgs Mm-hmm. Or what we would call sort of old school PGs. Yeah, old school PGs. They just don't make any more. Yeah. Right. I mean, Simpsons movie is a good example because that had two uses of the middle finger, full frontal nudity, yeah. underage drinking, cannabis consumption, which you, I didn't even know you could show in a PG. And now they and, um, Cartoon violence, which you can show in a U, but it shows like a uh, person being ate by dogs. And then right. uh, the war was being shot um, at like an arcade, fake Grand Theft Auto type of game. And mm-hmm. That movie probably should have been a 12A. But compared yeah. to all the sort of PG films from the 90s and 80s, uh, it's probably just a drop in the bucket. I remember right. Men in Black, which is now re-rated a 12. 
be, with the uncut version having the use of the word prick being said twice. That's right. Now, that didn't make much of a difference to me because I remember seeing that film when I was quite young. Mm-hmm. And that movie never scared me. It never upset me. I thought it was hilarious, but it yeah. did have a lot of swearing. And my mother was a bit concerned about me watching a film with that kind of profanity as young as I was. It's, she also again, felt that, yes, I'm sorry. She also felt that way a little bit about ants as well. Huh. Um, I haven't seen Ants, but it's it's odd that you and I have had some very similar experiences. I was about 14 when I saw Men in Black. Again, this was a few years before I discovered that films were edited in the UK. And um, so I was, I think, I think the BBFC say a PG film should not upset or disturb a child aged eight or over. That's a general rule. So I was 14. I was nearly twice as old as I was, as I might have been. Um to watch that and I remember watching that and being and I'm you know I'm not a prude but I remember being quite surprised at the amount of bad language and as you said that was the cut version and I always thought that was a particularly strong PG especially for the language really oh yes and also there's a sci-fi violence and gore that was uh could be quite mm-hmm. intense <laughs> yeah and people's heads explode with blue goo I thought it was right. hilarious but um I think any other four or five year old who saw that at the yeah. cinema, just like I did, mm-hmm. they probably would piss their pants in fear, particularly doing that cockroach fight scene at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think it's I think it's a I think it's maybe too little, too late. But I agree with it being rated twelve now for sure. Oh yes. Um. Well, a bit of nostalgia, unfortunately, sort of clad in my memories. Where? Yeah. Oh, I remember this. Yeah. But yeah, um, but I, I agree with your assessment there. A film that I do think that we did get a PG or an A certificate years ago that I think should be bumped up by two ratings, not one, is Jaws and yeah. Princess Mononoke. Um, I haven't seen the latter, but I, I do have a bit of a story about Jaws, if I if you don't mind me sharing it. Go right ahead. It was a it was it's one of those hugely well known films that I hadn't seen and I must have been about 16 15 16 and my mother had always gone on about it about how she'd been to see it at the cinemas when she was a young girl and how wonderful it was and we were out and about and she decided I'm going to buy this and we're all going to sit and watch it as a family so I was about 15 16 I have a younger brother who's 4 years younger than I so he would have been like 11 or 12 and we sat and watched it. And at more than one point in that, I got visibly upset and said to my parents, how on earth is this a PG? This is absolutely awful. This is shocking. I mean, I love the film, but I just did not agree at all with the PG. And of course, that's another film that's since been um, upped. I don't know if it's been re- resubmitted for um, home viewing, but I do know it was re-released in cinemas with a 12A. And I've got no problem with that, really. At the time when I watched it as a naive, young sort of um uh young man i did think this should be a 15 this is horribly horribly gory and blah 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 but in hindsight as an adult now I'm, i think i'm okay with the 12a i can accept that it's definitely not a pg film anymore and again hasn't been for a long while i would argue on some level i do understand where you're coming from because well 12 and 13 year olds know certainly a lot more than 12 or 13 year olds from 1997 or whatnot but you know that is a film that I always spring up and I'm sure Rob does and we think to ourselves that was that was horrifying that was gruesome and I saw that easy cinema in Milton Keynes and I must have been like 12 or something and I just was thinking to myself that was one of the most violent and intense films I've ever seen Mm -hmm. so i didn't see 15 films in 05 because i wasn't quite old enough yeah i was upset i couldn't see team america world police at the cinema at that time so (laughs) that's another story but yeah Yeah. um jaws is certainly stronger than (laughs) sad to say frost nixon which is the 15 but it got a 15 because he frank langella's nixon character says all those motherfuckers sound Right, I did not commit a crime on a crook. That's a very good impersonation. <laughs> uh, you pick up a lot of stuff from your American mother. Um, 
Simpsons. And I used to watch a lot of uh, American TV like Simpsons from Dexter's yeah. Lab growing up. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> a bit of a strange world, I'll say. Um, well, it goes without saying, really, before Cutting Edge or after Cutting Edge, what is the film that scarred you the most? It could be a U or an 18 or whatever it is, or bam. Oh, the, the film that scarred me the most. That's an yeah, interesting question. Um, um, I'll need a couple of moments to think about it. I, 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 I have seen things that have uh, profoundly moved me, whether that means it's made me emotionally like sad. There's certainly some things I've watched that are pretty horrifying. Um, goodness. Uh, well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say scarred, but it's the first one I can think of, and I've told this story before. Um, I grew up with um, quite considerate, very considerate parents who didn't allow me to watch anything underage, and I went to school with a lot of kids in the eighties and the nineties who were watching Nightmare on Elm Street, and they were like nine. I was never allowed to do any of that, and I, I don't hold that against them at all. Um, but every Thank now and then, you. every now and then, my dad or my mom would say, I think you might like this. And they would watch it first to make sure it was OK. For example, I saw Terminator 2 when BBC One showed it in its extended version. And I must have been about 10 or 11. Um, this was back in the day when the BBC used to edit violence and bad language out of films on a regular basis, even if they were shown after the watershed. And I remember they'd watch that first and knew me well enough to say I could handle it, which I did, and I loved it. Um, but when I was about 14, my father introduced me to John Carpenter's The Thing, and that's a particularly particularly gory film, which is still in 18 right now. Um, so obviously I was far too young to be watching it, but he thought I could handle it. And I remember being quite, quite disturbed by that but at the same time I loved it and that really I have to give it to my dad that he basically kick-started my love for horror movies because I was exposed to the thing when I was only 14 um I think it was on the tv so it might have been slightly cut I don't remember it being cut because I bought it after I'd watched it and it still had all the bits and I remember from the tv but it didn't it didn't scar me it didn't give me sleepless nights but it did it did cause me a small amount of disturbance um because it's particularly gory, but I've always loved it since then. But I can't think of anything that's really upset me on a deep level. I get far more upset by reading or hearing about or seeing real life events, real life violence. I can't stand it. I can't stand um, anything like that. I have a real hard time with that, but I can watch the most violent action film and it doesn't, I find it very cathartic. Um, I like seeing bad guys get what they deserve because I know it doesn't happen in the real world. So there is a sense of relief if I watch a particularly violent, for example, action film, especially one with a vigilante theme. Um, but yeah, I would say that the thing that was a, I found that rather shocking as a 14 year old and did, what, didn't know what I was going to get when I was going into it. But then I came out, I might have been slightly disturbed, but I thoroughly enjoyed the viewing experience. Is that okay? Actually, that's perfect. Um, that's actually perhaps a more convincing tile because it is solidly a sci-fi horror film um, yeah. than perhaps, let's say, Robocop, which my co-host Rob um, will often sometimes refer to as the film that uh, traumatised him when he was a child because he had older brothers, so he got to see dodgy films yeah. uh, underage that I couldn't. It, yeah. it goes without saying that, um, I'm like you, I couldn't see certain stuff growing up. Everyone saw South Park, but I couldn't. Mm. Everyone saw Beavis and Butthead, mm -hmm. I couldn't. Uh, yeah. Pulp, Pulp Fiction, I couldn't. Yeah. But I certainly knew what those movies and TV shows were because I mm -hmm. saw the promos and stuff on Film 4. But when they would show like, the ad spin, I'd be like, Mommy, I want to watch South Park. And she'd be like, yeah. no, you can't. Right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know that's parents for you really you know um as far as well, it's it's trauma it, i was just, if, if you don't mind i was just going to say that it goes back to what you said about um 
being able to watch films when you're at the right age. And that's something that I feel we have less and less of compared to when I was a kid. Now, there's not that, you know, you're allowed to see things when you're allowed to see them anymore. It seems that anything goes, sometimes anyway. Oh, easily. With uh, everyone watching stuff on their tablets and phones, yeah. it sort of yeah. cheapens the experience, really. Absolutely. Um, the it's amount of people, I'm sure, who've seen Human Centipede or that film from Eastern Europe, I dare not discuss in public company. Mm-hmm. I'm yes. sure many people have saw that on their phones or their tablets. Mm-hmm. It's just out of sort of morbid curiosity. You know, you know I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, I am a sort of later millennial. Yeah. You're an earlier millennial. There's no way I would have dared try to access something like that because I was always worried either way, mother or father was going to get word of it or yes. I, yeah. my mind wasn't quite there. I mean, I've had a bit of trauma in my visual experiences with seeing anime. And right. I often yeah. talk about this quite openly on podcasts. Uh, there's two particular titles I always will discuss to where almost is a bit like a punchline, really. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I don't know if you have children, but whatever you do, don't show them Elf and Lead. Well, I don't, <laughs> and so therefore I won't. <laughs> That's one of the most violent 15 certificate cartoons I've it's ever seen. It's a yeah. 15. Wow. And the first set of uh, minutes like seven minutes in, it's all people's heads exploding, dismemberment, full-blown nudity, and people's hearts being ripped out. The the sort of most grotesque type of violence and sort of leering focus on female body I've seen. And then that's just not just the end of it. Violence against children, uh, implied rape, sometimes involving minors, animal abuse, and death from the dog. And that, other types of graphic material that I usually would assume would only be reserved at the 18 level. And for a long we, time. Mm-hmm. Are I we never, absolutely sure that it's a 15? It's not some kind of mistake? BBFC passed it uncut with a 15, noting strong bloody violence, nudity, horror, sometimes strong language. They didn't even list sexual violence or animal cruelty in the listings. Wow, that's I obviously I haven't seen it, so I can't I don't have a, I can't have an have an opinion on it. But from what from what you've just said, that sounds like a a huge oversight on behalf of the board there. Quite oh, quite startling. No, easily that this is one of the titles I think that they slept at the wheel. I yeah. feel that way about the film Compliance, which is pretty much a ninety minute film that's about sexual assault. It's played inside a fast food place. Um, uh, kick ass. I know. There's some sort of controversy about that, but I, I personally think that movie should have been an 18 because of how violent and sort of sadistic it is. Yeah. And uh, weirdly enough, Dom Hemingway, which involves Jude Law having his duck off, and he says the C word nine times and all really? sorts of fuckery going on about. <laughs> the BBFC seemed to have gotten more lenient um if i'm allowed to use it the use of the word cunt um we, we don't censor on this poor broadcast but okay, you are right because I, I could have recorded a, a censored version which you could have spiced in um but yeah i they seem to have they seem to be more liberal um with allowing the word cunt at 15 but it's not always applied consistently and i don't know why i sent them an email a few years ago asking about ricky gervais's live shows i think he's it was after the release of his third one which i think was called fame um and his first two live shows were rated 18 primarily for <clears throat> use of the word cunt and then his third one fame was released and it was a 15 and it had more uses of cunt in than his first two and i didn't understand that because they were they were released in just a few years of each other i don't believe any major guideline updates had happened in in that time i could be wrong um and i did get a response and they they argued why um why they felt it was okay as a 15. i think with the word cunt it's still pretty much the only swear word that can divide certain groups there are those who find it deeply offensive and there are those where it's not as offensive and i 
for me, I don't think it should be. I think it shouldn't always just be allowed based on how many times it's used in a work. It should be how it's used. And that was their argument for giving Ricky Gervais's fame a 15 and that he might have said it nine or 10 times, eight, nine, whatever it was, but it was how it was used. And I didn't fully agree with them because I thought, well, it's pretty much how he used it in the first two live shows, but he used it fewer times. And yet they were rated 18. I, d I don't get I don't get their rules with regards to the use of the word 15. It seems to be sometimes inconsistent and it's going to offend anybody who doesn't like it anyway. If you say it once or eight times, um, I don't know what's going on there. That could be a whole no. other podcast. No, actually, you're right on some respects. Well, for me, it sort of depends on if it's uh, used in this sort of American context, which is overtly misogynistic right. versus British Australian speak, which is sort of like casual banter. Highly exactly. offensive, but um, it's sort of dialed down a little bit because it's said between blokes. Now, exactly. if there's a man yeah. saying it to a woman, oh dear, you're in for a little bit of trouble. But yeah, yeah that. And, you know, I, I she, I'll tell you this, Lockstock and Snatch, they're 18s, but I personally didn't find them quite as offensive as, let's say, three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri, which had four uses of that word, and it was mm -hmm. an American set, even though it was made by Irish filmmaker, but it's quite vulgar, particularly yeah. because Americans almost never use that word, you're, and when they do, right. it's, it always seems to be anti-woman. Yeah, and I guess that's what I that's what I was trying to say, but you said it better. And that it it also depends on it depends on your audience. I've lived in America for twelve and a half years. In fact, I recently became a U.S. citizen um, a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations! Uh, thank you very much. And so I can say we now because I'm American. <laughs> um, we Americans over here, there is there is I have learned that from living here that that is a word that um is used differently here than it is in my native uk um even you look at something like the angel share the ken Lodge film that we did for my show and it was an 18 because of it, it was originally rated 18 because of the multiple uses of the word cunt and Lodge argued this is how this is how these guys speak it's not offensive it's part of their language um and obviously it got edited 15 initially and then it was released uncut at 18. But I think I think if you showed a film like that in the States, um, um, Americans would realise that it doesn't have to just be a misogynistic word. And certainly growing up, the way I heard it used, I can't think of any instances where it was used misogynistically. It was always part of conversation or between men i don't remember ever being exposed to anybody referring to a woman um using that word so it is it is odd how it has how it has a different meaning here in america than it does in in the uk and i'm not quite sure why that is really i know you know in the u.s because i uh, also live in california um, okay i'm also british um you know it's it's play because of a cultural shift because canadians don't really use that word either and okay with the um colonial area where many of them say through plymouth bay and then spread onwards uh, to the colonies um they probably stick into the more traditional meanings of such words which is why sometimes where you see americans will say during the fall instead of doing the autumn so yeah. it's kind of that mistranslation there. But in all fairness, um, in our, on the UK level, compared to our um, Commonwealth brothers in Australia, who seem to use it in a very far about way, yeah. in my area, which is the southeast, no, 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 no. I've yeah. got a, you know, quite a Christian grandmother, and uh, I dare not use that word in front of her. Absolutely. I even have to be careful if I said bloody or bugger. Oh, dear. I'm sure... <laughs> Um, I don't know which part of the country you're from. You, you sound like you're from. Are you a Geordie? I am. Well done. Yes, that's. I originally hail from the northeast. Yes. So yeah, they probably might be a little bit more relaxed on that sort of thing because it's a bit more um, well, part of my southeast posh ways, a bit working class, <laughs> a bit. No, gritty. I understand. And we're we're nearer to Scotland, where it's used a lot there as well. So that's that must be part of it. So, yeah, you're probably right in that respect, Sam. You know, on a regional basis, uh, if you use that language in the southeast, 
particularly in those sort of Tory areas like Surrey, Kent. Yeah. Might be in for a bit of a rude awakening. Yeah. Why not get your cup and Jaffa cakes on a Friday morning <laughs> before work? That's for our English fans who are listening there. Um, because there's that <laughs> cultural mistranslation. But because you said UK US, um how is it like for you to be in um America with MPA system? I know because I also live there as well. You don't yeah. get the black card before the movie starts, which I do find a bit disappointing. Yeah. But you do get those green cards before the trailers start, which I find interesting. They don't do that anymore in the UK. Oh, really? Um, no. Um, yeah, back in the day, um, if for anyone who's Gen Z, it used to say before the trailers, you certificate or you trailer for a PG film. That's Not right, anymore. But in America, we still have that where you'll say the following feature has been approved for appropriate audiences. Rated yeah. PG-13 for intense sequences of violence and action. Yeah, it did. It it um it used to say approved for all audiences. And I guess they realized that that was I noticed that it changed here a few years ago and that the green card that comes up used to say this advert this advertisement has been approved for all audiences. And now it says appropriate audiences, which I, I don't know when that happened, but it wasn't too many years ago, I don't think. No, you are right. Um, I think around 09 and 10, uh, particularly maybe. 09, they, they changed the policies a little bit because of some controversies and complaints about trailers for films like Paranormal Activity and Bruno, yeah. which were being played during sometimes <laughs> even PG films, which... That's terrible. That's just a bit bizarre. I don't think yeah. we should be playing films that are intensely scary or raunchy doing kids' movies. But no. PG-13, it's a bit more of an open field because you can right. have films that are aimed at anyone at PG-13. Mm. Um, but, yeah, that's probably where it sort of came about. But uh, let me just put it between you and me. I know you yeah. said Red Band trailers. I yeah. did see them a few times in cinemas, like when I saw Deadpool 2. Yeah. They had a red band one for like Happy Time Murders. Okay. And I just, I really didn't like it. One, it gives too much away in the spoilers. Yeah. Two, you don't need to show everything all at once just to sell the movie. I liked the element of surprise a little bit. And I, I do think red band trailers are sort of what we would, our equivalent would be like the 18 or 15 trailer for the yeah. 15 or 18 film. It, it's a spoiler fodder to the core, and it sort of ruins it a little bit for me. I like a little bit of discretion. I don't yes. know. Yeah. I don't know if it's the same way. I know horror-wise, you know, Jaws was probably the first proper one I saw, but actually the first one I saw in cinemas was Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, which really? people don't think is a horror film, but yeah. it is. Yeah. And you see all the Halloween costumes. I'm sure you get at your door where you live in America, like trick or treat, and people yeah. dress up as Jack Skeleton. That's and that right, was yeah. when PG films, you know, there weren't a lot of animated films that were PG, but here was yes. one that was, and it yes, earned absolutely. it for good reason. Yeah. <laughs> but on your end, so yeah, I know, sorry if I was been in tangent on that element sorry about Straw Dogs, which, um, yes, another masterpiece. So, influenced a lot of vigilante films of its time i know people tend to talk about clockwork orange or yeah Fritz the cat but straw dogs was probably britain's most prominent vigilante revenge film i'm actually a fan of that subgenre myself i've done a podcast with rob about that very same thing and um it was certainly one of the most controversial podcasts that we've done particularly because I feel a lot of vigilante revenge films, whether they be 18 or 15, sort of prey upon people's bloodlust. Yes. It's like violence porn. Well, for want of a better phrase, yes. Yeah. Uh, particularly my favourite one is Fallen Down, which is oh, a bit of an unusual yeah. one to sort of discuss, but it certainly influenced the likes of films like Joker, and God yeah. Bless America, which are two films I can think of that uh, can be very dangerous to talk about to people who don't know about it. I don't mm -hmm. know. You, I know 
Joker was never cut or censored for UK or US, but would that be an interesting cutting edge episode? You'd be willing to do it on, particularly because of those protests about it being this incel ass shooter movie that would appeal to mentally disturbed people. Um, there, it's certainly an idea, yes, because it's as you may know, we don't always examine films that were cut. It's sometimes just films that um, found it hard to get a rating or something like that. Um, like, for example, we did one on The Exorcist. Um, um, never cut by the BBFC, but yet it had a very interesting history. One of the things I wanted to do with the show was to um, kind of uh, convey to the public that certain films were cut that they might not be aware of, for one. Everybody, I think I once said, you ask anybody on the street in the UK and they'll say, oh, yeah, Evil Dead was banned and Evil Dead was edited. And there are certain films that the casual public um, knows were cut. But I don't think anybody on the street would necessarily know that Eraser, the Arnold Schwarzenegger action film, was cut or Under Siege was cut. So one of the things I wanted to do was to, um, I guess, try to open people's eyes to the extent of censorship in the UK, but also to do what I call case studies about films like The Exorcist that casual viewers may have thought was banned or may have thought was cut, but wasn't. Um, and I, I did a lot of action films early on because that's a genre I liked and it's a genre not a lot of individuals necessarily would be aware had been um, cut. Um, but then I kind of looked at other stuff. I did horror films, of course, because that's a natural thing. Um, uh, I don't really know where I was going with this. <laughs> I think I've answered everything there. But if I haven't, please tell me. I think you did on your end, um, which I certainly respect, because, like, you are right. There are many films that have came out, Men in Black particularly, because of the two uses of prick that they had to yeah. remove to get the PG. Mm -hmm. That's not something that comes into people's memory, particularly no. um, in Blighty. But Clockwork Orange, which, contrary to popular belief, was never banned. Right. Stanley Kubrick withdrew it through distribution for the UK market. Ireland banned it, on the other hand. And it was never censored, but they did ultimately release it in 99. That's and, right. Uh, so, yes, you are absolutely right in that respect. I know one particular example was big. I remember seeing that on Sky One when I was about 13. And I love that movie. It's got Tom Hanks. But I didn't know in its uncut version there was a scene where a boy, and this was PG in the US, says, Who the fuck do you think you are? Yeah. I, I, I was, when I saw the uncut version, because I was in the States at the time, I got it from the library, I was a little taken aback because. Yes, it's PG, but it also depicts a child using that kind of language. Yeah. Which I would have thought, oh, the Americans, it's a little bit puritanical, they like yeah. to say they are, will get up yeah. in a tizzy about it. But I guess <laughs> they let it slip this time, just like they slip with Beetlejuice, which, yep. weirdly yep. enough, is the first 15 film I ever saw that okay. in Matrix. But yeah. I, I didn't quite pick up on why it was 15 when I initially saw it. Although I did get a little bit concerned, you know, because my mother and father let me watch it as long mm -hmm. as they were standing with me for yeah. guidance. And I was like, I don't know, should I watch this? It's a 15. Oh, I feel yeah. bad. <laughs> but they let it pass through until years later, I realized, well, there were some gory scenes. Yeah. Comedic, but gory. And there was also that scene where it says, nice fucking model, mm -hmm. which I, I guess, because now it's a 12A. Yeah, it's a bit. It's a it's a mild fifteen. It's like Gremlins. It it could yeah. have been a twelve, but twelve yeah. just wasn't possible because it didn't exist until eighty nine. Right. I know for you because you're older than me. I wasn't born in eighty nine. Can you shed some light on your experience with that particular rating when it first came out? Uh, you mean the twelve? Yep. Um. Well, yeah. It was obviously I was just a child when it was introduced for cinema releases. Um. So I'd, I've got no memory of that. And um, it was adopted for video um, in on July 1st, uh, 1994, I think I'm right in saying. Um, 
I don't remember seeing anything about it, uh, the new rating being advertised. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the first 12 film I saw um, in theatres um, was Goldeneye. So, um, and of course that was cut. I didn't know at the time. Um, I was slightly too young. I went to see it New Year's Eve um, 1995. So I wasn't quite 12. Um, that's the first film I remember. That's the first 12 film I ever saw. Um, and there weren't many 12 releases on video in the years after that. I think it was probably early 2000s when I began to notice that the 12 rating was being more widely used. That's just my own experience. Um, no, you, you are right. Well, yeah. Um, I think they didn't know quite what to do with it because a lot of 12 films had that PG-13 aspect about it and they wanted the, the big money. So they yeah. cut and trimmed a little bit of stuff just to get it to PG. Yes, um, I remember. Obviously, there was that five-year gap um, where there were movies that were twelve at the cinema, and they either had to be cut for PG or upgraded to fifteen until the twelve was introduced five years later. And I find that crazy. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that anymore. But that is, that was a very the wilderness years of the twelve A on video uh, between eighty nine and ninety four. Um, that was a very because in theory, you know, you could have gone to see Batman in the movies and you could have been 12 to go and watch it. And yet you couldn't legally own the same version of that film on video because it had been upgraded to a 15. That's crazy to me. No, it is to me, too. I mean, you know, for a long time, cause I uh, remember Batman and I thought, well, why can't kids go see it? And then yeah. the rating explains itself, which was a little bit unusual. It was actually much worse for animated works and anime, more so than for superheroes. But I know with superheroes and animation, those are the two particular genres I can think of that usually tend to draw in children. Mm -hmm. Whether they see it underage or above the age um, is a matter of debate, really. But yeah, that always sort of confused me a little bit, especially... Yeah. <laughs> with stuff like South Park and Akira mm -hmm. um, and the Beavis and Butthead you know having the, the little circle 15 sometimes even 18 on some of these cartoons and I was always like perplexed as to why I couldn't go see it yeah, I don't know right. if that was the same for you like oh I want to see Spitting Image no you can't 15 <laughs> um, yeah I, do, I can't think of any any specifics I don't think but there there were um, there must have been some films that I wanted to see but wasn't allowed to. Um, but I can't think of anything that I desperately wanted to see um, when I was underage. Um, I do, I think my, um, <laughs> on a similar vein, I think I, 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 I remember more seeing artwork on sleeves and uh, especially for 18 rated horror films. This is before I'd got into horror films and being, being slightly disturbed by them. Um, Silence of the Lambs was one, Candyman was another. Um, and when you're like eight or nine and you see these and you go, 18? Oh, it's going to be ages before I'm 18. Um, I, but uh, yeah, I, I can remember that more so, is looking at this vivid artwork on these films and handling them in the video store and wondering what was inside, the forbidden fruit um, that I never thought I'd be old enough to get to see, because when you're nine, 18 sounds like it's a long, long way off. Exactly, though. But as you get older, it's almost like, hmm, oh, I remember when I was 15, or I remember yeah. when I was 20. It, it, yes. Time flies by fast, especially yeah, it does. as you work, go to university, and pay taxes, and blah, blah, blah. It's it's a bit soul-crushing, really, but I did feel <laughs> yeah. that way a lot with uh, animated works, like Perfect Blue is one that comes to mind. Well, actually, let me reverse that. Ghost in the Shell, 15 certificate. I was like, but I can't even see it. Yes. Yeah. But I ultimately got the DVD at Borders. Yes, Borders actually existed before it went into bankruptcy, kids. And I must have been 13 when I got that on DVD or something. And then I, um, they didn't check my ID, weirdly enough. Because I was tall and I had a little bit of a mustache, but yeah, 
I had a bit of a badass streak about me when that moment happened. But, uh, <laughs> ultimately, I got in a bit of trouble for getting that DVD because once word got out that there was some nudity in it. Yeah. Um, it didn't help. I was at an all boys school and I couldn't really right. meet girls. So I yeah. turned to MTV and Japanese cartoons for kicks. I feel right. sorry <laughs> saying this. Hopefully, <laughs> Mrs. Salko doesn't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> but, uh, sort of well pulp fiction is one particular film that was 18 stuff again that I, I wanted to see because i i like the dark haired lady on the vhs yeah. cover i think that was another one actually now that you mentioned it i was the same way i was like what is this and what does that name mean pulp fiction <laughs> i know how you feel it, it, it was almost nondescript and why yeah. there was the lady smoking the cigarette yeah on the vhs cover didn't really give you an idea that it was essentially a movie about drug users, crime dealings, yeah, uh, racists and rapists, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, two people holding up a restaurant hostage and then trying to see into a suitcase. And the, yeah. the Uma Thurman character really only appears for it in a, like less than 10 minutes right, yeah. in the entire movie. So, you know, don't judge a book by its cover is all right. I'll say. And I'll right. say that even about Lady Chatley's Lover, which for a long time <laughs> was banned. That's right. You know, and now when you look at all this dirty stuff on the internet nowadays, Lady Chatley, and I'm probably Fifty Shades of Grey, looks kind of mild. Yes, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Did you feel that way about certain books or music as well? Like, let's say you saw Clockwork Orange or Lady Chatley at the bookstore mm-hmm. or a certain album by a band that like let's say like uh, dr dre or mm-hmm. uh nwa were you always a bit perplexed as to why oh it's this dangerous book oh it's got a parental advisory sticker um i i i can uh, i was i don't have i don't i can't think of anything specific like that with regards to music or books um but if i just if i may go back a little bit i remember you you just mentioned uh, nudity in that anime ghost in the shell i was um i mentioned earlier that sometimes i'd be allowed to watch something underage if my parents had vetted it beforehand and uh, to mention under siege again i was actually about 12 when i watched that on video and it was obviously a 15 and it still is a 15 and rightly so um and of course it was cut slightly i didn't know that at the time also but my I watched that with my dad and um, he didn't have any issue with me hearing the swearing. There's not a lot of it anyway. Um, didn't have any issue with the violence. The only thing that he did was, there's a, I don't know if you've seen the movie. I've never seen Under Siege. Okay. There's a, there's a scene where um, a woman has um, overdosed accidentally on sleeping pills and she's inside this giant cake. And she's a stripper and she gets moved slightly by the hero and she kind of half heartedly, she's still kind of woozy, leaps out of the cake and briefly exposes her breast. That's the only bit that my dad objected me to seeing as a 12 year old. I remember him leaping up off the sofa and standing spread, <laughs> spread eagle in front of the TV just to hide that one bit. There's, I think there's always been a thing or at least there used to be a thing about nudity in English society and that it was somehow the worst thing in a film could sometimes be because you saw some breasts, not the swearing, not the violence. Um, but I, that, that, that's a very clear memory I have that, that he was fine with me watching men get shot and stabbed and shoved onto bandsaws. Um, but I couldn't see what amounts to maybe three seconds of a topless woman. That's the only thing he, he that wasn't right for me to see, even though you see that kind of nudity in 12 films and even PG sometimes. Well, it's an Anglophone thing. We've got, you know, a sort of Victorian streak about us. America yeah. more so, where just even showing um, someone's sausage or someone's knockers, oh, yeah. no, it's it's immediately pornographic. Yeah, There's right. almost no context behind it, really. And that yeah. sort of, yeah. you know, when you compare it to our French and German counterparts, we do look a little bit silly in that respect. I would agree, yes. We get a bit up in arms about that. But at the same time, when it does show in films, sometimes 15s and obviously 18 and R18 stuff, 
we take it even overboard and sometimes it just comes across as quite leery and for the male gaze and yes yes uh, takes the fun out of it really yeah um yeah. i mean titanic is probably the one film i can remember that i was told cover your eyes yeah, yeah and, right. and i'm sure that's happened for many millennials yeah you know, when that scene came up saying draw me like one of your french girls mm-hmm. i mean had that if that came out now with its 12 which it has yeah. in cinemas mm-hmm. it would get even more complaints uh, people just aren't used to nudity and stuff like that uh, yeah. anything below 15 or R that's just yeah. you just don't see it I I think I, I'm, I may be wrong but I seem to recall that James Cameron originally got an R rating offered for that film and I believe he fought it um, hmm. I thought he was bribing them saying hey, <laughs> all this money give me my PG-13 well I I always I always feel that Steven Spielberg was treated leniently by the BBFC and the MPAA to some lesser ex- lesser extent. Um, oh, absolutely. Save and Private Ryan and Jaws are two great the, examples. Yeah. Um, the Indiana Jones movies, <laughs> um, um, which were all originally in the UK PG. I believe that, um, well, obviously, um, the second one was cut. I did an episode on that for the show. Um, but yeah, he always seemed to get away with more than um other directors might have gotten away with and that i I never understood why that was you know there was no such thing as guidelines back then so exactly even if there was um bribery or studio interference on their part because mpa is the major studios that have some sort of share and stake in it bbfc is independent accountable to the government Yes. I'm sure, you know, one way or another, there's some sort of back end deals that we don't know about that not even David Austin or yep. Emma, uh, Sarah Peacock and the company who works at BBFC can sort of confirm or deny. So mm-hmm. that might be taken to a sort of inquiry some yes. point in the future. It's not Mary yeah. Whitehouse that will do it, no. it will be us. You're right. <laughs> yes, most likely. Yes. <laughs> oh yes, um, you know, it's a strange world indeed there, but you know, I know I'm rambling on here, but I will change the subject a little bit on your end. Now, I know for you, Cutting Edge is probably the most popular work you're known for, but you've also um, are responsible for a lot of film soundtracks um, and making yeah. your own music. Yeah, I, that's a that's a sort of, I guess you could, I guess it's like a hobby, really. I'm not well known i'm not famous for the film music work i've done um but yeah i have i have done i've worked on oh, 100 and something i can't remember how many projects over over 100 i've done in the last um 16 17 years or so i find that quite impressive you're almost going to give uh trent Reznor and atticus ross a run for their money or who's those <laughs> other names carter burwell and hans zimmer who tell you to be <laughs> the big names in soundtrack music but um, speaking as someone who makes music myself, um, we probably have similar influences because mm-hmm. I've heard a few of your songs. I'm oh, really? certainly getting quite a few uh, influences of stuff like BT, who's an American oh. techno yes. DJ, yeah. and uh, Jean Chaperi, Jean Michel Jarre, uh, um, a little bit of Tangerine Dream. Well, correct me if I'm um, wrong. Um, I. I think the only Jean Michel Jarre work I know is Oxygen. Um but um in terms of in terms of people who who write or wrote film scores who I greatly admire and have a lot of respect for John Barry is probably my hero. Um Hans Zimmer is definitely up there. Um Michael Kamen. Um I I I love the work of Cliff Martinez who's worked with Steven Soderbergh over the years. I particularly love his ambient work. Um, I'd say those those names probably are the first ones that spring to mind. I did I did do an uh, a sort of ambient score for a film that's available on Amazon Prime. It's called The Happiest Place on Earth. Um, it's about 90 minutes, just under 90 minutes. And um, that was a it was a long slog to get that finally released. And when it came out, um, the movie was reviewed by um, certain online 
magazines. And more than once, um, my work was compared to Mark Isham, who did Crash um, in 2005. Um, and uh, I, I was hugely humbled by that, that somebody thought my work reminded them of Mark, Mark Isham's ambient stuff. Um, so that was, that was a very happy moment when I read, read those reviews. In all fairness, with your music and working on the film project, so certainly keep up the good work. Um, it you. helps to establish connections. Like this. it's quite difficult for musicians who don't have, let's say, signed to labels to get connections. Yes. Or even get performed live. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely right. I would say so too. Well, I was going to say if you had any last minute thoughts or. Um, I am qu quite aware and I I did a live stream earlier in the year about this is that a lot of a lot of my small but uh, very respectful fans of my show Cutting Edge are eagerly awaiting future episodes of what I think is season three now season no I'm season Five seasons? I can't remember what season I'm up to. I think it's it looks season, like season six where you've done 40 Towers. Okay, thank you. I can't believe that. Season six. God, I thought I'd done three. Season six, I do apologise. I, I am a, a, aware that the episodes have not been released as frequently as they have been in the past. And I addressed that in my live stream, which is on the Facebook Cutting Edge page. Um, so I'm not going to go into that again here. Um, but... For in short, my life in the last few years is not the same as it has been when I was churning these episodes out. I have got episodes planned. I'm still working on them and um, getting my researchers to help me out with it where needs be. So I haven't given up on the show. It is going to continue um, when life doesn't get in the way as much, if that makes sense. So yeah, there will be more. I've, I think I've got some good episodes lined up. Um, it's just a case of having to source the necessary materials, do the research, make sure my facts are in order. Um, and, but that that is proving to be slightly harder to do now than it was three or four years ago. So if anybody's listening who likes the show, it will be coming back. And I apologize that its release has been so very slow and staccato, but I haven't given up on it. I'm more than happy to understand. Um, speaking as uh, adults here in the room, um i don't know about you but we don't really get paid for a lot of the projects that we're doing we do it out of passion because right, we're committed right. to the subject right. um so you know outside of the working life of uh, 37 42 hours a week um you know, time can be quite limited especially if you've got um family wife or children so we're more than happy to understand uh, to yeah. our fans and listeners here especially as someone who can sort of relate to where you're coming from on our end, although things do vary because of this gig economy, everything's sort of temp-based, so you mm -hmm. have to be yeah. in for what there is these days. It's it's not easy. No. It's not easy. No. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little sad that I haven't been able to get these out as rapidly as I have done in the past, but as I said, as there are episodes I want to do. It might mean that the season is shorter than other years have been i might have to put a title on the back burner for now because i don't have access to the materials that i need but it's not as i said it's not something that i've shut the door on by any means it will be back and i'm sorry that it's taking so long we understand the apology um on one little question before we finish um mm -hmm. do you sometimes work with um moviecensorship.com because it usually tends to be the easiest website to sort of trace back what was trimmed or what wasn't but it's from a german perspective right um i did give them some um background information on their article on the da vinci code before i did the episode for cutting edge and i believe they thank me at the bottom um i've written some comments on their underneath articles before but it's not something that i go on very often sometimes i found and that's i'm not i'm not berating them or having to go at them. Sometimes I find their information is somewhat slightly incorrect and hard to understand. I think there's a, I think there's sometimes a problem with time codes depending on whether something's PAL or NTSC and they've converted it. 
And this, it's, you, you, you can't really understand, I don't think, um, I, I don't think you can always comprehend cuts that were made to a film purely from still images and descriptions, which is why I think the video essay format that we use is easy to understand and better. You can see and hear um, alterations. You don't get that with still images. So I am aware of movie censorship. I came across it a few years ago. Um, and they've certainly helped me in the past when I've had to double check something. But every now and then I spot a mistake or something that they've missed, particularly sound edits. Um, sound edits are sometimes quite hard to discern. Um, and that's why I helped them out with the Da Vinci Code episode. I think I helped them out with saying, oh, it's not just the visuals here, but it was also this was reduced on the audio and all, all that kind of thing. So I'm aware of it, yeah, but I don't go on it very often. My loyalty will always be to Melon Farmers. They're the, that's the website that got me into film censorship and reading about it and trying to understand it and examine it. So my loyalty will always be to Melon Farmers and they actually host host the show. The videos are on YouTube, but every every video I make has got a um, the same um, information, but in text form. So if anybody is unable to watch the video, they, they can always at least read the article. And um, the guy who runs that website, Dave, um, has always been extremely helpful, understanding. Um, and if I need to thank anybody for anything to do with my show, it would be Dave. So Dave at Mellon Farmers, thank you very much indeed for all you've done for me for almost a quarter of a century. I'd also like to thank Dave too for the information that he's provided on uh, my end and Rob's as well, because we both sometimes use that website for a lot of research. Um, yeah. I know IMDB sort of takes the fold in this respect, but Melon Farmers is much more comprehensive. Yeah, sometimes absolutely. maybe a little too comprehensive because they also <laughs> include porn and R18 titles on there so too. Thank you very kindly for um, speaking on this podcast there. Um, Mr. Salkeld for Gavin. I don't know how you want to be referred to as. You can use my first name. I'm quite, okay. I'm quite fine with that. All right, then. Well, I'm happy to have you on board there, Gavin. If anything thank else comes much. up, we're more than happy to speak with you in the future. I would be delighted to be back on. I've um, thoroughly enjoyed this and thank you for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.